Good morning, church. I hope this day finds you safe and well. Well, in keeping with the observance of Valentine's Day, I wanted to share with you a message today about love. We'll continue our Reading Sermon Series with installment six, where we'll continue to work our way through the Gospel of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount to examine those words we find written in red ink. Those words the Lord spoke to his disciples 
Today we'll be looking at the words the Lord said about love, or perhaps a better way of saying it would be love perfectly. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Join me as we continue to read together in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 5, picking up in verse 43, reading through verse 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, these five short verses come to the core of what you called us to be. Lord, we bow our heads in prayer today. We pray that you would open our eyes our ears, our minds, and our hearts, that we would be receptive to the truths that you want us to see today in your word. Pray that you'd open our hearts, that we might live these truths out, not only in how we react with you, but how we react and interact with others. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. It was John MacArthur's comments. The first half of this is found in Moses' law, Leviticus 19.18. The second part is found in how the scribes and the Pharisees explain and apply that Old Testament command. Jesus' application is exactly the opposite, resulting in a much higher standard. Love for one's neighbors should extend even to those neighbors who are enemies. Again, this was no innovation, since even the Old Testament taught that God's people should do good to their enemies. Proverbs 25, 21 teaches. These verses plainly teach that God's love extends even to his enemies. This universal law of God is manifest in blessings which God bestows on all people indiscriminately. Theologians refer to this as common grace. It must be distinguished from the everlasting love God has for the elect, as we read in Jeremiah 31, verse 3. But it is a sincere goodwill nonetheless. In just these five verses, the Lord teaches us what it means to love perfectly and what it actually looks like. First up, the issue. Jesus begins this portion in his Sermon on the Mount saying, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Lewis A. Barberi Jr. writes in his commentary of the text, the Pharisees taught that one should love those near and dear him, Leviticus 19.18. But Israel's enemies should be hated. The Pharisees thus implied that their hatred was God's means of judging their enemies. But Jesus stated that Israel should demonstrate God's love even to her enemies, a practice not even commanded in the Old Testament. God loves them. He causes his sun to rise on them, and he sends rain to produce their crops. Since his love extends to everyone, Israel, too, should be a channel of his love by loving all. Such love demonstrates that they are God's sons, as we see in Matthew 5, 16. Loving only those who love you and greeting only brothers is no more than the tax collectors and pagans do. This was a cutting remark for the Pharisees. D.A. Carson writes in his commentary, The command, love your neighbor, is found in Leviticus 19.18, but no Old Testament scripture adds, and hate your enemies. Rabbinic literature, as it was later preserved, does not usually leap to so bold a negative a conclusion. The quotation also admits, as yourself, words included in Leviticus 19.19 19, and again in chapter 22 in verse 39. And the attitude reflected ignores the fact that Leviticus 19 verses 33 through 34 
also commands love of the same depth for the sojourner, the resident alien in the land. The popular reasoning seems to have been that if God commands love for the neighbor, then hatred for the enemy is implicitly conceded and perhaps even authorized. Luke 10 verses 25 through 37 shows how far the neighbor category extends. Jesus allowed no casuistry. The use of clever but unsound reasoning, especially in relation to moral questions. The real direction indicated by the law is love, rich and costly, and extended even to enemies. But the content of that love is not based on a presupposed definition, but on Jesus' teaching and example. To love one's enemies, though it must result in doing them good, as we see in Luke chapter 6, verses 32 and 33, and praying for them, as we see here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, cannot justly be restricted to activities devoid of any concern or sentiment or emotion. Like the English verb to love, we see in the Greek agapeo, ranges widely from debased and selfish actions to generous, warm, costly, self-sacrifice for another's good. Like the parable we see of the Good Samaritan, there's no reason to think the verb here in Matthew does not include emotion as well as action. We all know how easy it is to love someone who is lovable. And we all know how hard it is to love someone who isn't lovable. And we all know that we're supposed to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves in obedience to the two great commandments we find in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. But here we learn that we are to love not just God, and not just our neighbors, and not just ourselves, not just those who are lovable, and not just to love those who aren't lovable. We are to be loving perfectly those that are our enemies, those that would hate us, revile us, persecute us, and seek to do us harm. That's a lot to ask, a lot to ask of anyone. And yet, that's exactly what God the Father did for us, what Christ has done for us. And that's exactly what the Lord is commanding his disciples to do as well, to love others, even our enemies, to love so perfectly in thought and word and action that we are literally seeking their good. Beside, as Bob Goff said, love difficult people. You are one of them. Think about that for a moment. Someone, someone took the time to love us enough to care about us, to give us the very best. And that means they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with us, seeking our best, even while we were yet enemies of God and maybe hostile to them. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 teaches a powerful truth that brings home the connection. It reads, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, if the Lord was teaching us that to love perfectly meant loving our enemies, because that is what God has called us to do as he did, and as Paul writes, that we were enemies of God ourselves at one time. He loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to save the world through him, as we read in John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved us, even when we were his enemies, he loved us enough to send his son to save us, to die for us, and to do that while we were still enemies of God, as Romans 5, 8 teaches well, that's exactly what the Lord is calling his disciples to do as well. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? But that's exactly what happened. 
Michael Hussar said, the gospel is the only story where the hero dies for the villain. Christ showed us how to love perfectly, even when we were his enemies. Then Christ showed us that love perfectly when he died for us. Now, Christ expects us to love perfectly as he did those around us, even our enemies. Next, the reward. The Lord continues, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? We'd like to think of ourselves as somehow different and perhaps more deserving than others. But in our hearts, while we may be tempted to believe it, we know that just isn't true. So we work hard to close our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts to the truth that we are no more deserving of God's mercy, grace and love and God's goodness that he's allowed to come into our lives because we don't really want to be confronted with the truth that we had no part at all in it when we were born, where we were born, to whom we were born, to what circumstances we were born, and how we had those issues or do not have those issues when we were born, whether it be race or gender, ethnicity, geography, family of origin or class distinction, physical beauty, intellectual capacity, or athletic prowess or the lack therein. That wasn't up to us to decide. None of it, that we were born at all, when and where and who and what and how, was entirely up to God and God's goodness alone. And then to further bring the point home, anything that we may have done in the way of making any effort at all to improve anything in our lives, whatever it may be, is also entirely dependent upon God's goodness to us. Every faculty we have, our ability to think, breathe, see, hear, taste, speak, and move about on our own power is all a direct reflection of God's goodness in our lives. It's been said that we have a problem in this world today. It's a problem of forgetting that we're all one race, the human race, and that each of us matters to God and we should matter to each other because we first mattered to God, that God would be mindful of us, as the psalmist wrote. The fact that God bestowed his mercy, grace, and love on us should not allow us in any way to believe that we are somehow better than anyone else. We're not better. We're bought, and bought with the most high price, the shed blood of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. That doesn't make us better. That makes us bought. And as a result, we are now adopted children into the family of God and heirs with Christ to the kingdom of heaven. That is our reward. Yet we must not forget that the Lord made this part of his statement here in the Sermon on the Mount conditional. He said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? There's the condition that we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We must remember that those of us who've been saved, born again, whereas Titus chapter 3, verses 3 and 8 teach, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. We need to remember, we were all villains who have been saved by the hero, Christ Jesus. We were all guilty of sin. It was Tim Keller who said, sin infects us all. And so we cannot simply divide the world into the heroes and the villains. We were all unrighteous before God. We were all under the wrath of God and due the penalty of death for breaking God's law. Not a one among us was worthy of God's mercy, grace, and love in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 make it abundantly clear. Reading, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That was the way we were. Yet somehow, Somehow God in his mercy, his grace and his love acted on our behalf to give from his heart of such great love that even when we were God's enemies, so that we might receive God's very best, his son, Christ Jesus. We didn't want it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. And we didn't will it to happen. It is all a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God in Christ Jesus. It was and is and always will be a gift of God to the people who didn't deserve it and yet will always have it. It can be refused, but once it's been received, it can never be taken away or lost. The problem for many people who have received it is that they've forgotten what it was like to be lost. That someone looked upon them with God's mercy, grace, and love and shared with them the saving gospel of Jesus Christ so that they would have an opportunity to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And likely, while they were still enemies of God. No one, no one can honestly say they found Jesus. The truth is, they weren't ever even looking for him. It was he who came looking for them. He sends somebody along the way to share the saving gospel of Jesus Christ even when they weren't lovable, even when they were enemies of God, even when they weren't necessarily wanting to hear the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and his message of love. Yet someone, someone obeyed Christ's command to love perfectly, the perfectly unlovable in each of us, and that made all the difference. We were drawn to Christ by the love of God we were shown by others. And now we must do the same with those around us, even if they're not so easy to love or are our enemies. How we demonstrate that best when we are truly disciples of Christ was to do just as he's told us in John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then he showed us that kind of love perfectly on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34. That's right. While he was hanging on the cross, he looked to the Father and asked, asked him to forgive those who were persecuting him, crucifying him as they were dividing up his clothes. The reward is just as the Lord said, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Lastly, the command. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
be perfect. No one's perfect. No one could possibly meet the expectation of the Lord as he commands to love perfectly. Louis A. Barberi Jr. continues in his commentary on the text, his message demonstrated God's righteous standard, for God himself truly is the standard of righteousness. If these individuals are to be righteous, they must be as God is, perfect, that is mature, teleai, or holy. He did not lower his standard to accommodate humans. Instead, he set forth his absolute holiness as the standard. Though his standard can never be perfectly met by man himself, a person who by faith trusts in God enjoys his righteousness being reproduced in his life. Christ Jesus met that standard, and he did it on our behalf. It's because of what Christ has done for us that we now stand before the Father God in Christ's righteousness, not our sinfulness. And because of Christ's imputed righteousness, the reality of our changed status in Christ before a holy and righteous, a perfect God is just that, holy, righteous, and perfect. And we as believers in Christ enjoy what Paul refers to as an already but not yet status. You see, God the Father sees us as holy and righteous, perfect in Christ because of who Christ is and what he has done on our behalf and what the Holy Spirit is doing in us and to us and through us through the process of sanctification that makes us every day more and more like Christ. Yet here, we're actually working it out. Fear and trembling. It's an already happened there, but not yet here. To get to the place of holiness and righteousness and perfection, it's the inward transformation work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, whereby we decrease and Christ must increase. Our part in the whole process of sanctification is to work with the Holy Spirit as he leads us to daily repent of our sin, deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow him. That is, to be transformed in our inward man by God's Holy Spirit and be born again and then live out each day according to God's word, doing that which is in accordance with God's will and walking in God's way as Christ. That's what we mean when we say, obey God's word, do God's will, and walk in God's way. Allow me to share with you a story I think helps illustrate the point we're trying to make today. You've heard of the, the Disney story, Beauty and the Beast. Well, Paul Green shares this in one of his messages about Christian love. I thought it was appropriate to share with you today. He writes, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the story of Beauty and the Beast. There are a number of variations of the story around, probably the most popular of which is the Walt Disney version. But basically, it's the story of a poor peasant who was stealing some food from the grounds of a huge castle which was inhabited by a beast. The beast catches him and says, I'm going to put you in my dungeon and you will be my prisoner forever unless you send your beautiful daughter to live with me. And to cut a long story short, the daughter decides that she would save her father by going to the castle and living with the beast. Now, of course, unbeknown to everyone, the beast is really a handsome prince who'd been turned into a hideous beast by a fairy after he refused to let her in from the rain. And the only way that curse could be broken was for him to find true love, despite the way he looked, despite his appearance, despite his ugliness, and despite his, his demeanor. He had to be loved as a beast before he could return to being a handsome young prince. And in the closing scenes, the beast lies dying from a wound inflicted by his enemy, Gaston. As he lies there dying, Belle the beauty confesses her love for the beast and just in time gives him the kiss that breaks the curse. G.K. Chesterton, the great thinker, writer, was a big defender of fairy tales. He said that fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And his favorite fairy tale was this one. Beauty and the Beast, because it teaches that the unlovely must be deeply loved before they can become lovable. He said that the noble lesson behind the fable of the Beauty and the Beast is that one must be loved in order to become lovable. Someone treated like an animal will become an animal. 
someone treated with worth, dignity, and beauty as a human being will become a human being. The unlovely must be deeply loved before they can become lovable. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still unlovely because of our sin, Christ showed his love for us by dying for us, loving the unlovable. Yes, we all know how easy it is to love someone who is lovable. And we all know how hard it is to love someone who isn't lovable. And we all know that times we have been unlovable. And two, we all know that we can love because God first loved us, even when we were unlovable. And finally, we know as believers that we are supposed to love God and love our neighbors in obedience to the two great commandments. But here, here we learn that we are not just to love God and not just to love our neighbors, not just to love those who are lovable, and not just try to love those who aren't lovable, we are to be loving them perfectly. Our enemies, those that would hate us, revile us, persecute us, and seek to bring us harm, just like God did us. Yes, it's a lot to ask, a lot to ask of anyone. But that's exactly what God the Father did for us. That's exactly what Christ did for us. And that's exactly what Christ is asking of each of us as believers, disciples of Christ, those who claim to obey his teachings, seek to do his will and live as he lived. It means to die out to our will and do the will of God the Father. And that's to love everyone perfectly, just as he loved perfectly. Why? We turn again to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Well, that's all we have time for today. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he make his face to shine upon you and may he give you his peace. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Church, remember, it may be Valentine's Day. When we're outside these walls, where are we? We're on mission. And remember, it can start right in your own house with those that are lovable and those who aren't. Have a great day. Spirit
Skins by your love.